Hi, I'm Alexandra Jung and I'm one of the lecturers here at Curtin University. Welcome to one of our chemistry labs here at Curtin Bentley campus. Today we are going to be making ethyl ethanoate through a number of processes such as esterification, isolation and purification. Esters are prepared using a carboxylic acid and alcohol. They are very fragrant and often have fruity odours, which make them ideal for use in perfumes, nail polish remover and artificial flavourings. Additionally, esters are often used as a solvent. Now, before we begin, we need to be aware of some safety considerations. Alcohols are flammable, so we need to keep them away from any flames. Carboxylic acids are also corrosive and we'll be using concentrated acids in this experiment, so we also need to avoid skin contact. To make ethyl ethanoate, we start with ethanol, so we're using 15 mils today, and glacial acetic acid, um, we're using 20 mils today, and pop that into a round bottom flask. Now, as you can see in the equation, the esterification reaction is an equilibrium reaction, which means it's reversible or can go both ways. So in order to increase the yield of our product, ethyl ethanoate, we can do a number of things to do so. Firstly, if we um, use an excess amount or increase the reactants in our reaction, for example, our acetic acid, according to Le Chatelier's principle, it will shift the reaction to the right, thereby increasing the amount of our products here. You can also see that there's water that's one of the products that's formed. Now, this is not great because it will shift the equilibrium to the left thereby reducing the product that's formed. So in order to remove that or minimise that effect, we can try and get rid of the water. And we do that by adding sulfuric acid, which is a dehydrating agent that removes the water. When the water is removed, the equilibrium will shift to the right, according to Le Chatelier's principle, thereby increasing the amount of our product that's formed. So we are at our fume hood and we're going to set up our reaction now. So first thing I need to do is add um, our ethanol, which is 15 mils. So we'll add that into our round bottom flask. We then now need to add our glacial acetic acid. So we're adding 20 mils of glacial acetic acid. And lastly, we're going to add our catalyst or our sulfuric acid, which is one mil. Now, before we actually set it up, for safety reasons, we have to add some boiling chips as well. And basically what these boiling chips do is they provide a surface for bubbles to form so that instead of bubbles bouncing on the glassware, the bubbles bounce on the boiling chips, so this prevents the glassware from cracking. Another purpose of the boiling chips is to also provide um, even heating of our reaction mixture. So, when we set up our reaction, there are two clamps. All right. Our bottom clamp is here, that's where it has to be tight on our round bottom flask, that's what's holding it up. You also see a second clamp here. Now this clamp doesn't have to be tight, it's just there as a backup in case it falls over. Another thing to notice is here, our clamps are also in this direction. You'll see it's uh, the slopey bit is on the bottom, that's also a safety issue. Just in case this is loose, if it's loose it'll fall on the safety issue. So we just have to lower our reaction into our hot water bath and that's when it's going to be heated. Now the reason why we heat it is to speed up the reaction. Another way to speed up the reaction is to add a catalyst, which we already have done. When we're heating this way, it's actually called heating under reflux, which is a common technique used in synthesizing a number of organic compounds. Now what happens is we have our reaction mixture or our volatile compounds in the reaction flask. When those volatile compounds boil, the, there are vapours that are produced which rise up the condenser. The cold water from the condenser then cools those vapours which allows the vapours to reform as a liquid 
and it goes back into our reaction mixture. Now this is really important because if this wasn't here, our reactants and our products, which have low boiling points, will escape to the atmosphere, which then will be lost. Our round bottom flask is connected to our condenser. And this condenser is connected to a tap. So we have our, our water coming out from the top. So we need to first turn on our water. Check that the pressure is okay. So now our reaction setup is ready to go. So our, re our reaction has been refluxing for 45 minutes. We've just turned off the heat um, and lifted it up out of the water bath for it to cool down. Now we can isolate our product. So in our reaction mixture, there's quite a lot of things. We have our product, any excess acetic acid that hasn't reacted. We have water, which is also a product. And we also have our sulfuric acid, which was our catalyst in there. The ethanol that was one of our reactants should have all been used up um, because that was our limiting reagent. So we're now ready to actually do the next step. So because we have so many different components still in our reaction mixture, we actually want to isolate our product. And to do that, we're going to add some water to our separating funnel. The reason why we do that is because everything in our reaction mixture is water soluble except for our product. Pour in our reaction mixture, now there's lots of safety aspects that we have to consider when doing this. As you can see, I haven't put the stopper on because as soon as we put the stopper on, what we'll do is we invert our separating funnel, immediately release pressure in case there's any gas buildup in there. So I've just put the stopper on, invert and quickly release pressure. Now in order to ensure that all our soluble components enter our water, our water we have to shake it. And to do that, you have one hand on the stopper, the other one on your separating funnel, and shake. Release pressure frequently, just in case there's some gas buildup. So shake. Release pressure. And you do that three or four times. Always shake with the nozzle pointing the back of the fume hood for safety reasons as well. So then, take the stopper off, and what you'll be able to see are two layers. We have a bottom layer and a top layer. Our product, ethyl ethanoate, has a lower density than water, so it will stay in the top layer. We just slowly run off the bottom layer until the bottom of the line reaches the stopcock. There we go. And that's where our product is in the top layer. Now we repeat that one more time to ensure that all the water soluble products will end up in our water layer. Okay, so the next step is to remove any um, leftover acetic acid or sulfuric acid that may be present. So we're just adding about five mils of sodium carbonate to our reaction mixture. Invert, release pressure straight away. And again, shake. There we go. We'll take off the stopper and let our reaction mixture settle. So at this point, any of our excess acid should have reacted with the sodium carbonate that we just added. So again, we then run off our bottom layer, which is where the sodium carbonate is, and any excess acid will be in our bottom layer, and our products will be in our top organic layer. So we're almost there. So we have our product, which will be in our organic layer. However, there may still be some traces of water in there. So we need to remove that. So what I'll do is I'll just run this into a clean conical flask, and we add some calcium chloride. The amount we add depends on how much water we have. So we add enough so that when we swirl it, the calcium chloride moves freely around. If there was water still in there, 
what happens is the calcium chloride will react with the water and it'll clump and stick to the bottom. So we've just finished um, removing the water from our product and the next step is to purify our product. And we do that using a distillation reaction. So it's set up here, we just have to transfer our product into a round bottom flask. And taking care not to um, include any of our calcium chloride that we added to dry the product. All right, we'll just add a couple more boiling chips. So this is our distillation setup, and there's lots of different components. Our clamp tightly hooked onto our round bottom flask here. We've got a thermometer here with the thermometer tip just at the junction where it crosses over here. Our condenser, which is the same condenser we use for our reflux, but instead it's now horizontal instead of vertical. And then we've got a clean conical flask that's in an ice bath over here. Basically, what happens is as the reaction heats up, our product will boil. Our product has a boiling point of 77 degrees, so we need to monitor our thermometer temperature. We don't want that temperature getting above about 80 degrees. So we're going to be using the differences in boiling points to isolate or purify our product. So our product will boil first and produce vapours. The vapours will rise up to this point. The condenser um, with water running through it, we'll um, condense the solution back in, condense the vapors back into solution. It'll run down here and it'll be collected in our conical flask here. Now we also have an ice bath here, and that's just to try and collect as much of our product as possible because there may be some residual vapors that are produced, so it'll condense it straight away and um, collect our product in there. So to begin with, we just need to turn our water on. There we go, water's on. And crank up the um, temperature and let it distill. So what we're going to do is only collect the fraction that is below 80 degrees. And that is what we know is our product. So our distillation's finished and we've just turned off the heat and um, risen the apparatus over here. And the last thing we have to do is just work out or measure how much of the product we made. So to do that, we just put our collected distillate, which is in our conical flask over here, and pretty much work out how much we've made. All right, so we'll just pour it in to a measuring cylinder to work out the volume. There we go. And we've made about 17 and a half mils. And we can use that to work out our percentage yield next. We hope you enjoyed learning about the esterification experiment today and found it knowledgeable. In our next video, we'll be calculating the percentage yield of our substance. If you'd like to find out more about studying chemistry or a science degree at Curtin, head to study.curtin.edu.au.